All right. That's always a good sign when it says we're live. So <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, special St. Louis-based half hour early Ask the Agronomist. St. Louis. Um, oh, Cal, I remember I told you to turn that off. <laughs> yeah, I got a new producer here. We got to break in a new producer today. So we got Chris Calla with us, a uh, man in the chat and his producer. And uh, my special guest here today is uh, is John Chambers, and uh, John will introduce himself here in a bit. But uh, uh, John and I have known each other for a long time. We uh, we met for the I think one of the first times I remember meeting John was uh, this would have been back in the mid nineties yeah. um, when you were a sales rep in right. Ohio, and I was a contil rep in, in what we call row crops east at the time. And um, I, I don't remember why we were there, but it was sometime before Thanksgiving, I think. We were out making some calls, and I was riding with John that day. And he took me to this really neat place where they sold old-fashioned salt-cured hams. And I can remember the place just smelled amazing, and it was a neat place. They had all these hams hanging up, and I wanted to take a ham home with me for, for Thanksgiving to my folks. So I bought one. And um, I, I remember being somewhat disappointed that it was so salty. It was nearly <laughs> inedible. Um, so, so when they said it was salt cured, they, uh, they weren't kidding. <laughs> that was about actually that. pork flavored salt, I think is what it was. So. <laughs> so, so anyway, John Chambers, welcome. And uh, you, you can tell our viewers uh, who you are, what you do and, and introduce yourself. Sure. To thanks, Lance. Happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, so again, John Chambers, and I lead the market development organization here for Bear Crop Science in North America. Um, I originally grew up in Ohio. That's where, where I was from, a small farm, grain and cattle farm there. We had about 100 head of uh, registered shorthorn cattle. Um, then uh, went to school at Ohio State, got a degree in ag econ. When I came out of school, I went to work for a co-op in Ohio for a couple years and then moved up to Michigan to work for a retail uh, up there before Monsanto hired me. So they hired me back in uh, 93, I believe it was. And uh, Same year I started. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. So um, started as a sales rep up in Syracuse, New York, then uh, moved out of there back to Ohio and uh, was a sales rep there for a while before I made the big move into, into headquarters into St. Louis. And so then I've done lots of different things in our training groups and in, uh, in our product supply group. Um, was a sales manager, moved out to Denver for Colorado, Kansas, and Nebraska for a while. Then it came back in into product management and then into our global uh, group there supporting our Asia business, India, China, and Southeast Asia. And then I made a big move, move over to R&D. So I went over and became the global corn technology lead. And then about seven years or so, came back to the commercial business to lead essentially what I'm doing today. It was tech dev and agronomy back then, and then mm -hmm. it changed the name to market development, but essentially the same thing. So it was easier for me to remember what it was when it was called tech dev and agronomy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can move it back for you. Yeah, yeah, keep uh, things uh, simple uh, for me as our viewers know. <laughs> so, so explain, um, what the market development organization is, uh, what our purpose is, um, you know, what types of people that, you know, uh, a grower might interact with sure. that are part of your group. Yeah, absolutely. So um, market development at the highest level, simplest level, we provide technical support to our commercial organization, our dealers and our and our farmer customers. Um, so what I mean, when I'm talking technical support, it's it's product support. So kind of think of us as a bridge between the R&D organization, which that's where we're at today in Chesterfield, our, our, our big research you know, center here. And there, that would be our breeding groups, that would be our biotech group, the group that does our small molecules or develops the chemistry. So they invent the new products. But then uh, about two years before we launch those products, they hand off to our organization. And then we go out and we really expand that testing. So we take it to many more environments, many more locations, and we go much larger scale. So you move from small pot testing, maybe four rows, 17 feet, to a big chunk of ours would be maybe six or eight rows, 1,000, 3,000 feet, or split plan or whole field type, type work. But our goal is to really figure out when we give these products, uh, put them in the hands of our customers, that we know where do you place them, how do you manage them, 
to optimize the performance. So uh, how do we do that? There's roughly 360 people in the market development organization here in North America. The biggest groups there would be technical agronomists mm -hmm. like, like yourself and, and your team there that are working primarily on our seed and trait side of our business, but also are able to position our, our crop protection products and how to optimize their performance on our seed and trait footprint. And then the other big group would be our tech dev organization. So they're conducting a lot of our in-house research, a lot of those trials that we that we that we talked about there, and also providing support to our crop protection sales organization. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you've ever been to, uh, there's people watching that have maybe been to one of our focus sites here in Central Illinois, either at Roanoke or Warrensburg. Um, you know, the we've got our the big research farm at Monmouth. There's a big research farm at Jerseyville. Um, you know, the folks that are working at those focus sites, you know, would yeah. be part of your organization. And um, just, you know, an, another way that we try to get information out to customers, learn about our products and, and share, um, you know, how we think uh, those products need to uh, need to be used and, yeah. and how you can use them on your farm. Yeah. So, no, that's right. There's roughly 85 of those focus sites around the U.S. Uh, another, oh, probably 80, 50-ish other satellite locations, mm -hmm. so similar out of that, and do roughly fourteen to 15,000 trials per, per year. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, tremendous amount of work that, uh, that goes on to bring those products, you know, kind of bridging the gap between uh, research and sales and, and getting the, uh, you know, the products ready to, to, to go to the customer so you can hopefully have success with them on your farm. So, we got... With uh, with you and I and Chris here in the room, we, we got three old Monsanto guys sitting here that, that, that are part, they're part of Bear now, and uh, I was just doing a little math in my head. There's uh, there's there's almost you know, there's over eighty years worth of Monsanto sitting in this room here. Um, what, what's your favorite part of being part of Bear? Now? That's a that's a good question. You know, I, I think my favorite part is the the vision that Bear has. Um, and the investment that they make to, to bring that vision to life. So our vision is shaping agriculture to benefit farmers, consumers, and the planet, which is, you know, that's a big, bold statement to make, you know, to, to say, hey, we want to go out, we want to change an entire industry for the better, to help our customers, uh, to, to help the, uh, the uh, uh, folks in, in general. Um, but we're truly investing in to make that happen. So Bears investing close to $2.5 billion a year in our R&D efforts, mm -hmm. which is essentially double what any of our other competitors are investing in the space. And so a true commitment to make that happen. And that's that's what gets me excited. That's why I love agriculture, you know, grew up in agriculture, wanted to be part of that and help make it better. And, and Bears committed to that. So that's probably my favorite thing. John, how would that have changed maybe from Monsanto to Bayer? Is yeah. it, does it look the same? What, what's really kind of changed yeah. in that R&D investment That's um, a, in, in the transition in companies? Uh, I get another great, great question. So I would say that the overall vision of what we're trying to, to deliver, so that the tailored solutions approach, and we can talk more about what tailored solutions are, very similar between the two companies. I'd say the two biggest differences are Number one, the breadth of products in, in R&D that we've got. So, you know, before Monsanto brought the seeds and traits, so industry leading in those spots with very limited um, work done in the, in the crop protection space. Bayer brings the largest crop protection business. When you look across everything, fungicides, herbicides, you know, insecticides there, as well as a seed growth platform. So, um, so that is is a big change. And then just the dollars. The dollars that now we're investing are probably over two x, or approximately two x what we would have been in Monsanto by by ourselves. So, so to me, that's the the biggest changes there. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know there's been obviously a lot of consolidation that's gone on in the industry and. You know, not all customers feel that's a good thing, but there's a lot of times when companies come together, there's synergies and cost saving measures and, and things get cut and the two companies are not investing in total right. as much as they were individually right. before. But in our case, I don't think that occurred. No. We've, if anything, we've probably increased. I think we went a little bigger. Right, right. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, we've, we've always been, you know, a company that's reinvested a, a ton of money back into R&D. 
Um, and, and that's you know, kind of what, mm -hmm. you know, that, that hasn't changed now that we're part yep. of Bear. And I, I agree with you. The, the cool thing for me is the depth of the portfolio. And I know Cal and I talk about this a lot. I mean, you know, we, we've always had the, the pleasure of representing, you know, DeCalvin Asgro and, and the great traits and germplasm. Um, but in the old Monsanto days, uh, the rest of the lineup was a little skimpy when you got <laughs> to uh, herbicides. We didn't have fungicides. We had hemp insecticides, um, you know, bear with most of the seed treatments that we were using as Monsanto yeah. were coming from bear. Um, and so it's, it's really nice to have, you know, not just a leading portfolio of seeds and traits, but leading portfolio of chemistry uh, from herbicides to insecticides, to fungicides, the seed treatments, um, you know, so that, you know, the portfolio of products that Chris and I can, you know, represent to the grower. Uh, is, is just super cool. And um, we've started talking a lot more about our pipeline in the, in the last year. We used to, in the old Monsanto days, we talked pipeline all yeah. the time. And I, and I think we got, I think we got to the point where we kind of thought people were, you know, maybe a little bit tired of hearing about it. And, and we didn't have as much cool stuff to be talking about, yeah. honestly. So we kind of got away from it for a few years. And, and uh, now it's, I mean, you can't help but get excited when mm -hmm. you're talking about the pipeline today. So it's uh, it's really cool when you look at you know what's coming. And I, and I guess since we're since we're talking about that, um, you know, what are some of the things in the sure. in the two year horizon that would be in market okay. development today that are coming that okay. excite you? Hey, maybe I may I may go a little outside of the two year as well. So yes, we, yeah, we, do, please. We, we, yep. We've got plenty of time here, so we'll, yes. we can, That's we can right. talk. That's right. That's hey, right. You know, one place that I like to start, and we don't really always think about it when you think of the pipeline, is our investment in our breeding organization. And and the reason I start there is one, it's the largest investment that we make out of that 2.5 billion. The largest portion of that goes into our breeding, and I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm that you know seed is the most important decision a farmer makes that determines the overall yield potential for that field and then everything else that we're doing is around how do we optimize or protect that yield right mm -hmm. you optimize it by the placement and management recommendations that that, that 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 go along with the seed and then you protect that from weeds and insects and diseases with the biotech traits with the cp port portfolio mm -hmm. there um, and, and with that investment, we've had some of the biggest change, the biggest transformation, probably of anywhere in our, in our organization there over the last several years. And one of the areas um, that is, we call it breeding 3.0, just an internal you know, term there, mm -hmm. but lots of different pieces went into it. But I like to simplify it down into maybe two big components. One, a, a lot of work done to make, I'll call it smarter decisions faster. And another piece around increasing the speed that we can bring products to market and the scale, mm -hmm. it's the size of the, of the portfolio. And it's very, very significant. So on the first piece, the smarter decisions faster, that the, what the group has been able to do is use artificial intelligence and machine learning to create models that help our breeders determine which crosses, which combinations they should be making, whether that's to create a new inbred or a new, a new hybrid. And the reason that's significant is I heard this stat the other day that a breeder has more genetic combinations that they can make than there are stars in the sky. There's literally trillions of combinations. So no individual person can keep track of all that. And that's where this type of machine learning, artificial intelligence can really, really help out. We've seen some nice advantages. You better utilizing that diversity in that genetic library than, than we would have before. So. So, so the, I guess the ability for, for the, for the viewers, I guess the, the reason it's so important to be able to use that machine learning and things, because you can't physically in the field, look at, evaluate and test that yep. many products. So if you can use the machine learning to weed out some of the yep. stuff that you don't need to waste your time looking yep. at in the field, we can hopefully have a higher success rate, yep. more hits mm -hmm. um, by, by 
yeah. and just looking at the, yeah. the very best. Perfect example. Some of the, you know, some of our breakthrough products have come from combinations using Thailand germplasm along with North America germplasm. In, in you know, in the past, our breeders wouldn't have found those things. They mm -hmm. wouldn't have been looking. They weren't working with that. But the, the models make the recommendation and, and, uh, and they come up with some some really good things. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, and, and Chris and I talk about this a lot, too. The I think something that frustrates farmers about the seed industry as a whole is, I mean, anybody that sells seeds is going to tell you they got the best stuff. And anybody that sells seeds is probably going to tell you they got about a 72.3% win rate and about an eight bushel advantage over the competition. It's funny how that math works out, but uh, we hear that from farmers all the time that everybody that shows up on their doorstep has a 70% win rate. Um, and, and so for, for Chris and I, it's, it's important to understand you know, kind of from a reason to believe standpoint yeah. of, okay, this is why our stuff's better. Mm -hmm. This is why we're not just, you know, telling a story. Yep. Um, you know, we, we've got great germplasm, we've got good people, um, but you got to know what to do with that good that's germplasm right. and good people. And and that's what the, those advancements of breeding are enabling yep. us to do. So that's, that, that's the first part. Yep. The second piece is, you know, you all may have heard that breeding is a numbers game, right? The more crosses that you can make, the more products you can look at, you're going to find better, better overall products. So the breeding organization worked to say, well, how can we expand that? How can we do do more? And two examples of, of what they came up with there. One is around the way we do our screening. So we've been able to move our screening efforts from the field into the lab. So what do I what do I mean? What you know, what does what's that look like? Well, in the past, if you made a cross. And then you would take the seed from that cross, you take it out the field, you grow it up, and then you'd look at it and say, hey, does this thing look like it's worth moving forward into true yield testing or not? Is, is ear placement right? The stock right? Just the overall looks and everything. And so that's where you start with the biggest part of your funnel and then you, and then you narrow it down. Well, through the seed chipping, which you, many of your audience, maybe you've talked about mm -hmm. that in the mm -hmm. past. Instead, uh, you just take each of those seeds, take a little tiny chip out of it, so the seed's still viable, you can still plant it. And then you take that chip and you analyze it. You run it through a, the genome-wide sequencing, and, and then based on 20 years of understanding the markers, the genome of the seed, we can determine just from that, is that seed worth moving forward or not? And so what that's done is instead of being reliant on the seasons instead of just being able to look at as many products as we had, you know, planters to plant and combines mm -hmm. to harvest and all, that we can do this 24 seven um, and not be reliant on the seasons and just go year round. And it's allowing us to screen somewhere between eight and 10 times more products than we would have mm -hmm. before. So that's a big, big change. Mm -hmm. The second piece then is just the time it takes to create a new inbred. So for, for corn hybrids, as you know, you're taking two inbreds and you're crossing them to create a hybrid. Well, a lot of your genetic gain comes from actually developing those inbreds. Mm -hmm. To develop an inbred, you do the same thing. You make a cross, but then you've got to self it. You've got to get it pure so you can, you can actually breed with it. And that takes five or six generations under the traditional method. Um, they we've implemented what's called DH or dihaploid or double haploid, which allows us to fix that now in one generation instead of five or six. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. That also is allowing us to create 10 times more new inbred lines to work with than what we would have in the past. And that's going to lead to significant more genetic gain. Right. And, and really everything you've been talking about mm -hmm. technically has nothing to do with traits. No, that's all just germplasm. That's just germplasm. And, and and I love that you talked about our focus on germplasm, our investment in germplasm, mm -hmm. because since, I mean, I've been around since traits came out. All three of us have been around yeah. since traits came out. And and I've always said that you can have the greatest trait in the world. If it's in mediocre germplasm, yeah. all it is is expensive average corn. <laughs> and, you know, so having that focus on genetics first and yeah. then you protect or enhance or improve those genetics with good traits. And, and obviously we, at, you know, when we were Monsanto and today at Bayer, we're you know, probably known more as a trait company, but, you know, we invest more 
in developing germplasm than we do in developing right. new traits. That's right. Um, a lot of money goes into both, but um, you know mm -hmm. that fact that we maintain that focus on germplasm to me is is sure. really good. Yep. Hey, and then and then so that's all about where we've been. So what we talked about right there, that's in the market today. The results of that is coming through on all the new germplasm. Where we're going then is what's called precision breeding. So everything that we've done, we've talked about so far, then we're looking at more products. But then once a product comes forward, then we test it all across an RM band. So you may test the same hybrid in Pennsylvania, all across the, you know, the Midwest, out through Nebraska. And then you're trying to decide, does it have a fit in any of these markets? And if it does, then we, then we, then we launch it. Where we're going then is what we call precision breeding. It says, hey, we're going to work with farmers in the local areas, whatever that area you know may be. So maybe it's there in central or northern Illinois and say exactly what are the characteristics of what we need? What do we need from standability? What do we need from disease, emergence, whatever that is? And then we will go in. As I said, we've got 20 years of understanding the genetics of the, you know, of the of the corn plant. And we can use that machine learning to go and help us design the product, tell us which parents, what crosses do we need to make that are going to give us the characteristics we want for that market. We'll make that cross and then we'll only test that product where it was designed to be tested. So we'll get way more specific at designing products for specific geographies. Mm -hmm. And we think that's going to deliver another jump in, in genetic gain. One of uh, one of my viewers sent me a list of what what they want. So okay, uh, you you can take this with you, John. <laughs> I'll do uh, that. Four four hundred bushel corn, healthy, drought tolerant, never goes down, and it's cheap. Uh, okay. was, was the was the ask? So I think, you, I think, you know you know what you're shooting for. I think that one's coming out in twenty seven. <laughs> that's what I what I, 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 I expected you. The first three would be yield. yield, yield. <laughs> you you kind of sum that up at four. Yeah, right, right. At least, at least at least your Illinois audience makes it easy for us. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. right. That's right. So, so that's uh, that, that's awesome, John. And yeah. and I know, um, you know, Chris and I have you know, we've tried to articulate that breeding 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 precision breeding story. Um, and part of that, you know, reason to believe why our germplasm is better. Um, but it's it's nice to get your perspective on that. I never quite feel like I'm doing that story justice when I when I tell it. Uh, but it is um, it, it is pretty cool uh, the advancements that we've made and continue to make and 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 how that should be you know driving better products for yep. you know all, all of our bear customers. So from a um, uh, I, I guess dialing it in a little more specific on you know new traits and stuff that's coming in the pipeline that will be attached to that amazing sure. germplasm. Um, what's uh, what's next for bear? Okay, so that's great. Let's start. It's a, it would launch this year, but I still like to start with it because I'm pretty excited about it. And that's the Smart Stacks Pro. Yeah. So I'm sure you've talked about that. Here, we have. Uh, here yep. before. We've had Jim Donnelly on before to talk oh, about okay. rootworm. Chris and I can't hardly find a rootworm. And, <laughs> and Donnelly somewhat hates us for that. Other, other, there's other reasons he hates me, but that's the primary reason he hates Chris is we don't have a lot of rootworm pressure. I'm sure there's other reasons he has challenges <laughs> with Chris as well. But, um, Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, you know, so for those, if it, if it is new to you, that's the third generation corn rootworm product. And um, why we're so excited about this is this is a brand new mode of action for corn rootworm. It uses the RNAi technology, so it's the first non-BT. And, and it couldn't be coming at a better time. We're starting to see some of the older technologies that all of us have been using starting to break down. We're starting to see more feeding on those and what we would like. But what SmartStacks Pro or that Corn Root Worm 3 is just phenomenal overall uh, a performance there, uh, by far and away the best. So that'll be a product that we're recommending for the high infestation acre will be the best performing on the market. Now here coming in 24, we have a VT4 Pro. Um, and what that's going to do is that's going to take that corn rootworm 3 technology. It has one of the, the BT traits as well as that RNAi technology. And we're going to stack that on top of Tricepta. So our most broad spectrum above ground product. And so what that's going to do, that's going to be more for your light to moderate you know, we weren't pressure, mm -hmm. so maybe more in, in your, right. in your all's geography. Yeah, Chris, Chris and I expect yep. that to be a big product for us. Yeah, and then pick, it can pick up a couple other pests. 
so western bean cutworm i doubt you've got a lot of that not there. much no but right. more earworm yeah uh, getting, we want to say better control yeah. of the earworm as well so can be can be a nice product um and then later in the decade we've got corn root worm bore actually it's kind of around that 27 ish time frame so not that far away mm. you know the corn root worm bore, gonna be a busy year <laughs> it is it's gonna be a big one That's a little faster than I thought it was yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, that's two brand new modes of action. And, we, you know, we've never launched two brand new unexposed modes of action mm -hmm. at one time. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason that's a big deal. That just means the durability right. of that product is going to be much longer than when you just take one new product and put it on to, you know, products that have already been ex exposed out there. So the pipeline looks phenomenal from a from a corn rootworm perspective. Yeah, that's that's exciting. And, and you know, I've. The analogy I've used with some customers is we, you know, we can remember when we went from no rootworm corn to our first, you know, rootworm trait and, and what a dramatic difference that was. And, and then when that trait started to get tired and we switched to smart stacks, yep. the dramatic difference that was. I mean, I think the difference between smart stacks and smart stacks pro today is bigger than the difference yep. between triple pro and smart stacks was right. when we made that switch, you know, years ago. So it is a, a totally you know, different level of root protection yep. than what we've got with smart stacks. And, um, and we've been, you know, Chris and I are, are blessed to be in a geography where smart stack still looks great. Yep. So we don't really have all the challenges that Northern Illinois and, and parts mm -hmm. of Iowa and Minnesota and Nebraska do, but we probably will someday. So, um, <laughs> we don't have to have the technology today, but not, nice to know it's available right. uh, when, when we do. So. All right. Well, that's a, a great, uh, great recap on on the rootworm portfolio coming and, and a lot of stuff. And I uh, echo Chris's comments. I, I didn't realize that uh, corn rootworm four was was quite that close. So uh, it is going to be when you when you look at it on a, you know, this wouldn't mean a lot to our viewers, but to the three of us that know how, you know, infrequently new products come out sometimes mm -hmm. to look at what we've got coming in the next few years. It's, it's really yeah. quite amazing how many new products there are there. So what's, uh, what's next? Next. So we'll, if we want to stick with corn, um, our we, viewers generally do want oh, to stick okay. with corn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't want to go to canola. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. No, no. Bar <laughs> but they barely care about soybeans. Some days. <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, debating on which way to go here. Maybe we'll go with the herbicide tolerant traits and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the smart corn system that I'm sure you've talked about as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. But from a herbicide tolerant, the next product we have, we, we're just calling it HT4 now. It'll get a better name, you know, at some point. Um, but it's going to, it's going to be the glyphosate, glufosinate. Um, we've got dicamba, We've got 2,4-D and then also uh, tolerance to the FOPs. And out of all of those, I think that FOPs toler tolerance. So think of products like, like Assure or Fusillade tolerance. And, and you may be saying, well, you know, why would I, why would I want yeah, that? We, a, right? a lot of people are, they're, they're using those products today to kill volunteer. Uh, volunteer, so okay. Maybe. So, yeah. Right. So. Um, and, and I will point out that this will this will be tolerant to the FOPs, but not the DIMS, which are in the same chemistry family. So products like Select will will, will still be available. So that's how you, we can control volunteer corn. But the reason that's important is, hey, today we're very lucky. We don't have a lot of grass resistance to glyphosate. But if that happened, if that evolved over time, you know, which it which it could, we're going to need another mm -hmm. another mode of action there to help control that beyond just the pre-emergent products that we have that also work very right. well. So that's that's one of the, the the key pieces there. And then following shortly behind that, we'll have our HT5, which adds a PPO trait. And we're working with some new chemistries there around the, in the PPO family that, that are showing the ability to control some of the weeds that are currently resistant to other PPOs. So that, that one's deeper in the pipeline. That's still going to be out many, many years from now. But um, the key message there is we know that insect, or I'm sorry, weed management is difficult. Weeds Again, they adapt over time and we need to stay ahead of them in developing new technologies. And I really think we are. And you mentioned a couple of chemistries in, in that HT4 corn package that 
we already use in corn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what does adding, you know, 2,4-D and dicamba tolerance yep. do for that system? Sure. Sure. So the, from a dicamba perspective, that even though we can use dicamba in corn today, that if once corn gets to a certain size or the temperatures are pretty high and all, you start you still see some impact mm -hmm. to that to that corn. So it it's tolerant. I wouldn't say that it's resistant, if mm -hmm. you if you will. Mm -hmm. Maybe not be the technical terms, but but it's all right. We're, <laughs> you're easily the most technical person in the room here today. So if you're good with it, John, I'm I'm fine with it. <laughs> so so essentially, it's going to make that that just more more safe. So we can go out and use those and not have to worry about damaging that 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 crop. You know, from a two four D perspective, to be quite honestly, the FOPS tolerance came with the two four D. So we really wanted the FOPS more than the two four D in corn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know that the two four D trait in corn there is is adding that much more. Mm -hmm. But it it was the it's what gave us that other that other tolerance. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, um, I think uh, m maybe touch on short corn, and sure. then we, we can uh, switch to beans. Sure. And uh, go back to the herbicide conversation. Okay. Again, when we get we to can, beans, we can do that. And, so. and we want to make sure and save time for uh, um, the the chemistry products in the pipeline as as well uh, outside of seeds and traits, and and uh, so there's. Um, lots more to talk about as Absolutely. we get deeper into the pipeline. Yeah, there. have some very exciting things there in, in chemistry as well. So from uh, the, the smart corn system that your audience may have heard about, powered by short stature corn. So let's talk about what it is. It's mm -hmm. short corn, mm -hmm. right? So what we've done is we've we've put a, a native trait. It's not the first product that we're going to have is not a biotech trait. That'll come afterwards. Um, but what that trait is doing is it's it's shortening the inner nodes or, or maybe the opposite. It's, it's stopping the inner nodes from elongating and it's making that plant shorter. So why would we want to do that? Is that? Why does that matter? There's really three benefits that we see come from that. And we use the, the acronym PAY. Mm -hmm. So protection, access, and yield. Your plant is much more resistant to wind events. So that can be green snap as well as, as stock lodging. And we've seen some phenomenal results, especially across to Iowa. We had a derecho this spring. We had one, I guess, two years ago as mm -hmm. well. Seen as winds up to 50 mile an hour. We really haven't seen any, any issues whatsoever. 50 to 70, you start to see a little bit, but significantly less mm -hmm. than tall corn. Now above 70, you start to see, you know, issues mm -hmm. just like when it's blowing right. green vents down. It's, right. It's, yeah, that, it's not going to stay. That, that, that's one thing we want to make sure people understand is while it's, you know, it's going to take a stronger wind event to damage your short corn, um, you can still do it uh, <laughs> if it gets bad enough. Yeah, so. That's true. Yeah. The, the second piece there then is around the access. So the, the, the product concept is that plant will be somewhere between five and seven feet tall, give or take a little bit, but either one of those, it will allow us to get through with a ground rig to make precision applications all through the season. So that could be, maybe you want to put your nitrogen on, you know, a little later in the season, or, you know, you've got the yield potential, maybe it's above what you, what you thought, and it's worth going in and putting a little bit more on. Maybe that's your fungicide application, whatever, but to be able to do that, not have to use, you know, a helicopter or airplane to put it on. Um, we think people are, are really going to like, like that, that piece. The yield then comes from that you've got a plant now that has a structure that can handle higher populations. Right. So the biggest issue with pushing populations in tall corn is you get a stalk that gets too too thin, too mm -hmm. small. And then again, it gets back to your standability. So the product concept here is that if you plant the short corn at the same population as tall corn, you're going to get the same yield. Mm -hmm. So this isn't one that says you've got to go put 15, 20 percent more on to get yield. That's not the case whatsoever. However, that we will characterize every one of these hybrids. We will have done multiple years of density testing at five different densities to create density curves that can help you, that help your, your viewers understand, you know, in their yield environments, where do you optimize yield as well as where do you optimize uh, profitability, which is probably more important. 
and and you'll be able to push those populations if you if you want. And I, I think our you know our data today on the hybrids we're selling today would generally say that the optimum economical seeding rate for a lot of products is probably higher than people are comfortable yeah. planting today. Mm -hmm. And my hope is with with short corn is it gives a grower the confidence to sure. go ahead and push population. Um, you know, we could probably push it harder today, but it's riskier. Right. And, right. Exactly. And, and you know, one thing I want to you know learn in our in our research over the next couple of years is I, I I know I know what we do, and and I so when I say we, I mean us and growers. You know, we we want to get the most we can out of everything, mm -hmm. and we want to find out how far you can push it. And and one question that I've had is, well, you know, if if uh, normal corn has X chance of going down at 35,000, at what population does short corn have an equal okay. chance of something right. happening? And, you know, I don't know if it's 40 or 45 or 50. I don't know where it is, but we'll, we'll probably find that oh, sure. because we're, we're going to push stuff. Sure. Um, but it, you will have the ability with, you know, less risk to push populations higher. Uh, I am very glad that our product concept is not to tell you that you got to go narrow rows and plant 50,000. Yeah. Because a lot of people will just tune us out no, yeah, at, yeah. at that point. Um, now, if you're, you know, if you've been thinking about going to narrow rows, it would work great for that. Yeah. Um, and if you wanted to push population tired, it works great for that. Right. But the, the concept is you don't have to. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. Yep. So yep. super excited about that. It looks looks really really good. Um, I did mention that you know we'll start with a, a breeding trait. So again, we don't need any global approvals, regulatory approvals. So that's nice. We're confident, you know, that we'll do groundbreakers next year and then we'll be the launch will be in 24. We are working on a biotech version that'll come out roughly in that 27 time frame. And that that's going to help provide a little bit more consistency and I think maybe even a little better ear placement. Mm -hmm. the, the, the ear placement is the thing that we really want to watch. We don't want those that ear to get below two feet mm -hmm. and working with the, the, the major equipment companies and we are working closely with them to understand how low can, can we go and still harvest and what that needs mm -hmm. to be and we feel really confident and that biotech version is going to help us out quite a bit there as well as just quite honestly from the manufacturing of it it'll it'll make it a little bit easier and allow us to scale up a little a little bit quicker and then we're also working on a gene edited version so depending on what the regulatory environment looks like in the future mm -hmm. um gene edited products might be easier to get approvals for than biotech so we're we're keeping that one uh, in the pipeline also do you, you since you mentioned that i'll ask um do, do we know how gene editing is going to be treated yet i don't really believe we do yet lance that that you know some 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 countries have already kind of changed in you know what from where they initially said and i don't think I don't think we're really going to know until we get a couple products that are going through the global regulatory process to see how they actually have them. Yeah, I know the hope was that they would be considered to be not the same as a modified. More of a traditional yeah, breeding, yeah. yeah. But I, I don't, hey, my my own personal opinion, not a bear stance, my right. own personal. We are I don't being believe, recorded here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I get ready to dump this, <laughs> but but you know I don't think it's going to be as simple as it'll just be treated yeah. as is you know yeah. traditional breeding, but hopefully something better than than yeah. you know, all the biotech regulation that we have. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I know uh, you know Chris and I have gotten involved, and Chris more than I, he's he's on some some teams and represents our organization uh, in, in the short corn arena and. Um, We've had a chance to have some trials out this year with growers, and that will be expanded next year with groundbreakers. And um, it, uh, it it does look like something that, to me, has the potential to to, to really change the way corn is grown. I th I think for the better. Uh, it's I, I borrowed this line from Dave Shannon, but I it, it just I, I love it. I use it all the time. And you know what Dave says is absolutely true. It's still corn, it's just shorter. Um, so it's it's not. You know, it, it's it's changing uh, the way we can manage the crop. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really changed the crop yeah, that exactly. much, but it gives you options to do things that would be more difficult to do with with standard corn. Exactly. 
I just thought it might mention we for years we've been working with Dr. Fred Belo's group yes. and, and mm-hmm. a lot a lot of our right. listeners right. love and appreciate Dr. Belo yeah. and some of the work that he does and, and we've had a great relationship with him for several years yeah. looking at short corn and short right. statue corn. He's got as much knowledge uh, about it as probably anybody. And so we've kind of got a local experts that we can uh, lean mm-hmm. on and, and I think we yeah. plan to do that as we probably get closer to launch times and right. not to right. utilize him and some of his uh some of his work that he's done to help um, position the product. Yeah, the yeah, that would be uh, that, that'll be fun to la- <laughs> launch uh, short corn with Dr. Bilo. So I, uh, I I'm still struggling with with smart corn, John. I'll be honest with you. That's a that's it does it just doesn't it, it, it I'll get used to it, but you know I, I just I have a little bit of a um, um, a little bit of uh, I guess a um, a uh, fear that, you know, we, we, especially this coming from my old Monsanto days, we were always accused of being arrogant and, <laughs> and, and not, not, you know, being the kind of company that people always wanted us to be. And I, I'm just afraid somebody's going to think it's insulting to the people still raising the dumb corn that we've got, <laughs> that we've got smart corn, but we'll, we'll get through that. So we'll, we'll try to be sensitive. <laughs> that's, that's all right. So, uh, so we've uh, anything else on the corn horizon? We we talked about the BT traits. We talked about the uh, um, herbicide tolerance, short corn. So, and and all these different traits. Uh, you know, in in the initial years, probably won't have you know every single trait offering we have available in short corn. But long term, you know, I would guess most of our traits will be offered through. Absolutely. That smart corn system, That's and right. it's not going to be restricted to just this trade or, or that. That's trade. correct. Yeah. No, yeah. you're absolutely right. No, I think that I think that covers the the corn pipeline okay. seeding trade pretty well. All right. Well, let's uh, let's jump into beans, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll touch on beans, and then end up with uh, with chemistry. We're not going to lose your audience when we do that. No, I hope not. <laughs> well, they um, there's there's something coming in beans that I think they're pretty okay. excited about. So hopefully they'll stick around with us for for that. It's super. In more ways than one. Yeah. There's there's something that. <laughs> that I'm pretty excited about there. Um, and, and that's our HT4. That's right. And so that's that's the big one that's coming up here in, in a couple years. So what HT4 is, is it's taken the Extend Flex system that we have today. So glyphosate, glufosinate, dicamba, adding both HPPD as well as 2,4-D tolerance. So um, that'll be the first five uh, uh, mode of action product on the market. And I think that's going to give growers absolutely the, 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 the best overall flexibility in a system. You know, hey, the way I look at it is the dicamba, the extend system is a great weed management system. No question about it. Hands down, it is the best system out there for overall weed control. Mm-hmm. You know, however, there are just some situations where farmers you know, maybe not aren't comfortable with that with that mm-hmm. dicamba. Maybe it's based on some of the other uh, you know crops and things that are growing around them, or for for whatever reasons. Extend Flex is a great system, mm-hmm. right? You've got a lot of flexibility. We can give you a program, uh, a full dicamba program where mm-hmm. you're putting it post if you if you if you like. Um, we can give you a program where you're going pre only or just very early post, or mm-hmm. we can give you a program without any dicamba that's really relied on your residual products as well as, as glufosinate. But the uh, the HT4 is then going to give us a couple other modes of action right. in there, the HPPDs as well as 2,4-D, and so really can even take that to the to the next level. So so really excited about yeah. that. Yeah, I think that's a... You know that's a trait platform that to me the the whole soybean industry could embrace and and regardless of what herbicide program your heart desires um you know it, it would be adaptable yeah. to that trait stack and uh you know can't can't, can't get there quick enough right. uh from chris and i's perspective and i and i know we get that and i know we'll we'll be out as soon as we can be with that product um you know maybe talk a little bit on um you know, I think we're developing some new traits to go in that stack. So, I mean, there's 2,4-D resistance today, um, but I think there's a different trait involved in our HT4 than what's in the current 2,4-D product that's in the marketplace, and and that's a you know a little bit of why it's going to take a, a little a little more time maybe yeah. than Chris and I had hoped to uh, to get that product out. Yeah, hey, that that is our own proprietary 2,4-D. Mm-hmm. 
or it, that yeah that's that's not one that we in license that that, right. will, that that will be coming out there right. yep absolutely right. and that, and that's there's there's reasons for that that I, I think people have seen that have been using that other system you know the, the tolerance of of you know enlist beans today to 24d is you know it's it's good but it's not you know you almost can't hurt an extend bean with dicamba um, you have a hard time hurting a Roundup bean with Roundup, uh, it's a little easier to hurt an enlist bean with 24D. And so there is room to have that level of tolerance be higher uh, to give you better crop safety, better flexibility. And, and so hopefully we'll see that with, with H34. Yep. Okay. And then, uh, so so I'm, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm starting to learn our numbering system here. <laughs> is there an HT5? There is John? an HT5. Yeah. And, You're, a quick learner. and yeah, <laughs> so, you're paying attention anyway. So, yeah. and, and, you know, and if we want to get really deep in the weeds, we can explain why there's five herbicide traits in HT4 and six herbicide <laughs> traits in HT5, and it's not because we can't count. <laughs> That's right. It is the generations, right? right. Not, not the number of products. But at HT5 takes everything in HT4 that we talked about and adds that same PPO that I mentioned before for corn. Mm -hmm. So again, just adding another tool. And to me, the big message here is, look, if farmers need more tools when it comes to, to especially weed control, when you look at it, there's not been a new mode of action launched for weed control in 30 years. Mm -hmm. The last thing we need to be doing is pulling tools and options off the market. We really should be working together to protect everything that we everything that we have. And unfortunately, you know, agriculture really is under the gun right now. There's a lot of people looking to take tools away. And that's everything from Roundup and Atrazine, you know, to Neonix, Dicamba, everything like that. And I, I, if I had one wish, that would be that as an industry, we would come together to really protect these products mm -hmm. to be used in a way that's safe, you know, for for the environment, for people and everything. And I, and I do believe we can do that. I just wish we would work better right. together. That, that's one thing Chris and I talk about a lot. And that's a, something we're proud of at, at Bear is that I, I think as a, as a company, we do a, a good job protecting the industry and standing up for mm -hmm. the industry and defending the industry. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's other Whether people. Whether it benefits us. Or right, not. right, right. I think other, I mean, everybody defends their own products. Right. Um, and, and some people defend their own product at the expense of somebody else's. Yeah. And uh, I think from a, you know, just a, a big picture standpoint, yeah it's you know a horrible precedent to set when you know anybody's product gets pulled from the market right. if it's a safe product and it was it's a registered product and it's been tested and and it is being used you know within the, mm -hmm. the label um no, no reason those products shouldn't be available yep. for for people to choose and 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 that's something that the bear feels very strongly about and you know we've we've helped other people you know defend Absolutely. their product when it when it comes under fire and uh, I, I agree with you that um, it's it's short sighted of, of people to, to not have mm -hmm. that approach. I think. Yep. We probably better move to the chemicals. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we we did run out of time. Yeah, we got about fifteen <laughs> minutes left here, and uh, and there is a lot to talk about with chemistry, um, and and some new stuff that sure. you know, we've learned about just here in the last few weeks. And and you mentioned it's been thirty years since the last new right. mode of action. Um, sounds like that's changing. And um, and that's and that's really cool. And, and that's probably the, the, the biggest um, thing that excites Chris and I of, of being part of the bear organization is, I mean, Monsanto had been out of chemical discovery for heck, about since you and I started. I mean, <laughs> it's been, right. been a long time. And um, and that's something that, that Bear has stayed focused on all this time. And they've had a tremendous amount of success with it. They've you know, there's a lot of people that do herbicide discovery, but don't ever discover much. Right. Um, and and Bayer has a, a really strong track record of developing new molecules. And I'll let you talk about sure. some of that stuff coming. Yeah, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about breeding and the transformation they made. And our small molecules group has also went through some big transformation. Theirs is more around the, the way they're doing their phenotypic screening and, and um, the, their, their early work. And so what they're doing is they're using more imaging 
to detect even small impacts to whatever the target pest is. Maybe that's palmer amaranth or maybe it's an insect or whatever. And then once they can see that they've got an effect, then they can go in and then they work to tweak that molecule in order to make it more effective. And that's proven to be a really new, unique way of, 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 of doing the work. And it's resulting in some pretty exciting, exciting things. So um, a, a number that, that typically I'll show if I've, if I've got a, a PowerPoint here is 70% of our discovery products are either brand new or unidentified modes of action. And that's super exciting. When we said, look, we haven't, nobody's launched a new herbicide mode of action, not just us, nobody has mm -hmm. in 30 years. The fact that we've got a pipeline uh, that's coming that's full of brand new products is, is super exciting. Mm -hmm. And that pipeline is two times the size of what it used to be. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one or two products, there's, there's a lot. Right. I think growers sometimes get there's new there's new names yeah. every year. Yes. There's new mixtures every year. Yes. Um, and sometimes growers it gets frustrating to figure out, well, okay, yeah, this is kind of the same as that, just with a different is name. Yeah. And so there's always new products, but the new modes yeah. thing is is the really yeah. unique part. Yeah. And the exciting yeah. part. And and hey, there can be a lot of value in some of the new mixtures, you mm -hmm. know, and things. But to your point, it gets it does get confusing. Hey, we're launching a new corn herbicide. It's a three-way, you know, pre-mix this next year called Tribolt. Mm -hmm. Um, it's gonna be a really nice product for corn. And you can spray it up to two leaf, but you probably ought to think of it more as a as a pre-product, mm -hmm. is probably the way you need to look at it. It's uh, again, three modes of action will really compete against those other products, Acuron, Resicor, that are in the market. And the real advantage is that it's gonna have is it's gonna be really strong for grass control. And it also is going to be a little more consistent in, in varying weather conditions. So if you don't get quite as much rain, it can hang in there a little bit longer, has a little bit of reach back once you do get a little moisture. So a really nice product, but to your point, not a new, you know, not a completely new mode of action mm -hmm. or anything, a, a new a new package. Mm -hmm. We do have a couple brand new products that are coming. One I'm pretty excited about, and this one here could launch, I think it's in that 24, 25 time. I, I forget exactly the year. We're calling it Conventro. Um, and this would be a pre-emergent product for corn and soybeans. And, and it's, it's, a new mode of action to the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not one of those seventy percent that I mentioned mm -hmm. before. So it's not a new overall. It's been used in Europe for many years. It never came to the U.S. It never came because it's got a real narrow mm -hmm. spectrum that it only controls it's, two weeds. Right. This is a funny story. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most most herbicides that kill two weeds are are yeah. worthless. Would be the word for, for. I could name a few of those, <laughs> but but uh, John John's story is better than that. But, but the two weeds this controls are palmer amaranth and pigweed and water hemp. And so, man, if you can only control two. <laughs> those are two pretty good ones. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good, good place to start, right? So, we, you know, we know that's going to have a great fit here in our market. We'll bring that out as, as part of a premix. So we're still working on what those will, what it will go with, because we really want to protect that. We need another mode of action there. Now, it is a pre-emergent. You know, ideally, I'd like to see a post-emergent product to come along as well. But we'll, we'll continue to work on that. But that, that's, a, that's one I have, I have high hopes for. Another tool in there to control those two weeds would really give us flexibility you know, in our, our overall systems. One that's further that down the pipeline, right now we're just calling it 679. Um, you know, it doesn't even, it's deep enough, we don't even have a name for it yet, but it is one of those new, um, brand new modes of action. Um, there's several different isomers of that, which just means that different ones have a little different spectrum. But think of these as post-emergent products primarily, but there is some pre-activity. Um, controlling grasses as well as broad leaves and different isomers will have a different combination of those. But this is really that more broad spectrum product that we've really been looking for. And it looks phenomenal. Um, the and other it, thing is non-selective, right? Non-selective. So there'll be a, a trait. So that that was the that. next piece Good. I was going to mention. And it's one of the advantages of bringing the two companies together. 
that we're working on the trait now at the same time as we're working on the chemistry. So we should be able to bring both of those to market relatively you know, close to the same time, which that wouldn't have been the case in the past, right? Mm -hmm. You would have started, you know, way after, and it might be 10 years. Right. I, I got the question the other day, do you expect us to, if, if, if they don't come at the exact same time, would we potentially launch the chemical without a trait? Um, I think we probably would, but, you know, then your market's going to be a little bit more limited. Right. In, it's a in, down market. It, it could, it, exactly, exactly. That's what, that's what you'd be looking at. And I don't know enough about the product to know, are there any crops, cereals or anything that it, that it would be for or not? I don't, I, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, John, you touched on, you know, a little bit when we were talking about, you know, defending the industry, um, but, you know, for freedom to operate to me is maybe the biggest threat, I, I think, to, to agriculture. And there's just so many people that, you know, have an opinion of what we do and would like to see us do things differently or not do things. Um, you know, from, from a big picture standpoint, I guess, talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what's Bear's role in that? Um, what's the industry's role in that? What's the farmer's role in that? How, how do we maintain our right to, yeah. to, to farm, I guess? Yeah. Hey, I don't know that I have the silver bullet there, but I, maybe I have a few asks or wishes or, or whatever, you know, hey, Bayer, we clearly play a major role. We're the largest egg company out there. We're a voice for agriculture and we need to be active. And I believe we are. I believe that that, that uh, we truly put resources in, and we work very closely with the commodity groups and other organizations to, to, to help do that. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's important that our customers, our farmers are out there are voicing, making their their voice heard, making sure that regulators um, understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, because there is a misconception. There's a tremendous amount of precision agriculture going on. The way that, that our customers are actually using products is different than what many, many believe, right? And they're, they're using them responsibly. They're all using them only where they need to because that, that's what adds profitability, right? right? You don't just use a product to use it, you use it in a, in a smart manner, the way it's supposed to be used. And so I, you know, I think that, that, that again, that the voice of the farmer carries a lot of weight, especially when the majority of our politicians really don't understand agriculture and the impact that agriculture has. But, um, you know, right now it's more than more important than ever. People are listening because there are concerns of food shortages and everything, and so it is a it is a good time for us to be voicing. This. John, one question I always like to ask and of, of guys like yourselves is, you know, we as agronomists we lay in bed and we worry about storms and we worry about things that are going on. But what what keeps you awake at night when you think about our business or our industry? Oh. What what really kind of you know. Big picture concerns do you have? Yeah, probably the biggest one is what we're talking about right now. It really is regulatory in in the ability we can create, we can invent great new products. Those could be biotech traits, that could be crop protection products. But if you can't get those products to market quickly, and you can't do it, uh, and and it's unpredictable, it puts mm -hmm. a huge amount of stress on you. The Smart Stacks Pros is exciting as is is that product is and i and what I, I i love that product that product should have been on the market four years ago mm -hmm. if that product would have been on the market four years ago it would actually have a much longer lifespan mm -hmm. but we had anticipated the other bt traits that we were stacking it with they wouldn't be as compromised as what they are and so it's going to put a lot more pressure on that rnai than what you ideally you would have had mm -hmm. and so the other piece is then Jim Donnelly would be a far younger man today <laughs> had that been out four years ago. So, you know, so that's just one, you know, one example, but also it makes it difficult that, you know, in our breeding program, you never know when do you switch to a new trait because you're not sure when, um, you know, when you're going to get the biotech approval which means you're you're pretty inefficient. You're running maybe two complete breeding programs instead of one because you you just got to plan for both. Yeah. We, we only got a couple minutes left, so I don't know if there's any last questions you want to ask him. I, I had one that, that did came in the chat that 
you know, yeah. of, of all the things you mentioned as far as the pipeline, what are the one or two just you know that, that excite you the most? Just do you think yeah. that may have the biggest impact or get you the most excited? Well, you know, hey, near term to me, it's Smart Stacks Pro. Maybe not for for your you know markets as much, but that uh, technology industry. is truly truly needed. Mm-hmm. A little bit longer term, it is that that smart corn system, short right. stature corn, and and it's because it's it's not just one thing, right? In certain markets, that standability is going to be huge, right? right? They've, they've seen in other markets that access, being able to maybe split that nitrogen. There's places that I truly believe there's going to be regulation that's going to limit usage. And, and therefore, you know, um, that, that that piece is going to be, be really good. And in others, it's that, that yield component. So it's going to fit many, many people. Yeah. All right. Well, we're uh, coming up on time here and John and Chris and I actually have another meeting we've got to get into. We, we got to walk like 10 feet down the hall <laughs> to a, a, a little bit more spacious room for the, uh, for the rest of the meeting. But I but, could have done that then. <laughs> y- y- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, there's if there's any left. Yeah. So uh, we, we had to start here early this morning and, uh, Chris and I discovered that uh, St. Louis doesn't wake up all that early. So you, you can't get breakfast at six in the morning in St. Louis. Uh, but anyway, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Sorry we didn't. Uh, uh, we, we probably talked to you more than we normally do, but we, we had John here and I wanted to, to be able to uh, get him to share his insights with you. So thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks, which normally I should have that date written down here. My producer will look it up quickly. What is the next date for Ask the Agronomist, Chris? Get my phone to work. So, uh, the, the 22nd. 22nd of September. We'll be uh, smack dab into harvest at that time. And uh, we'll probably have some interesting things to talk about from a, from a harvest update and what we're seeing around the state. So thank you very much, John yep. Chambers. It's been uh, wonderful having you on here with us this morning. And uh, we'll be back, be back with you in two weeks. Thank you. All right, you're off. Okay. That was okay. That was awesome.